it's clear. Lovely. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much to you all for the, um, pardon me, for the invitation to, to speak and, and uh, for staying up or not going out on a, on a Friday evening and staying in to listen to me. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about this, this idea, this concept, this hypothesis uh, uh, around a set of disorders that we're referring to as the human type 1 interferonopathies. And I'm a clinician, I'm a clinician scientist, but I'm a clinical geneticist by training, so I'm interested in rare disease. And using rare disease as a means of deconvoluting complex biology, much as people use mouse models of whatever. So we can learn from patients and families affected by these rare monogenic disorders. Actually, at heart of this talk is a, an absolutely fundamental concept, and it's the, the, the concept of self versus non-self. And I think we're seeing at the moment the, the consequences of what happens when you can't fight infection. We as human beings are at war all the time with, with infections, uh, viruses, bacteria, fungi, etc. And it's absolutely essential that we can repel and, and get rid of these, these organisms. And uh, it turns out that the way we've decided to do that over evolutionary time is to recognize, if, if I limit myself for the moment to viruses, we, we recognize viral nucleic acid. So we have to be able to fight infection. If you cannot fight infection, it, you literally die. We need very efficient uh, anti viral mechanisms and what happens is when the virus in, in enters the cell we our bodies are trained to recognize viral rna and dna and once they do that they they um they in, that 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 recognition system induces a type 1 interferon mediated antiviral response and you get consequently an antiviral activity and essentially what this talk is today about is diseases, genetic diseases, where that goes wrong, where instead of recognizing, it, this, isn't, this isn't about recognizing virus. In fact, these people are very good at fighting virus because they produce a lot of interferon. But the, the, the problem associated with this, this, uh, this evolutionary mechanism for recognizing virus is that our own cells are replete, they're stuffed full of our own DNA and RNA. And so it begs an enormous biological conundrum. How do you differentiate your own nucleic acids from those of viruses? And to cut the story short, I would say to you that that is a very, you, you have probably a, 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 a several layers which, uh, which try to ensure that you don't miss represent, misconstrue self as non-self. But there are situations where mutations in specific genes mean that you do misrepresent self nucleic acid as viral. And as a consequence, you produce an antiviral response all of the time. And essentially interferon is a poison. It's, it's like a disinfectant. It's very good for killing germs, but it's also very poisonous and you really don't want to produce it. You want to, you want to be able to produce it in the right place at the right time for a shorter period of time as you need it, not all the time, which is effectively what's happening in these individuals. So in 2011, uh, we wrote this little opinion piece, if you like, uh, suggesting that there would be a, a novel set of inborn errors of immunity associated with too much interferon. And, that's what I'm going to talk to you today about. So I think that you know one of, one of the problems in inverted commas I have is that when I talk, you know, people say to me, ah, well, Yannick, you're, you're just a stamp collector. You're just interested in rare things because that's your job and, you know, but it's not very interesting. It's not, it's not, it's not heart disease, it's not stroke, it's not inflammatory bowel disease. And of course, it, these things are rare. But as I said, I think what they can do is help us de deconvolute complexity and help us understand some of these other more common scenarios. So antiviral signaling, um, autoimmunity and, and, and autoinflammation. 
And actually, what I think is what I think is also possible. I mean, immune, the immune system is really a. I mean, it's not a binary phenomenon. And if you actually think about it, I mean, the coronavirus the, the pandemic is showing us just one example, just the latest example of, of how important it is to be able to fight infection. And I, I would not be at all surprised if there are polymorphisms in genes, which mean that some people are better at fighting infection because they either produce a small amount of interferon all the time, which acts as a kind of low-grade disinfectant, or they are very, very good at producing interferon as soon as they are infected by a virus. Uh, and I think possibly the, the kind of flip side of that will be that those individuals are, those, are, the, are the very people who are predisposed to developing things like systemic lupus erythematosus uh, as just one possibility. So here's a definition. Uh, these are monogenic disorders in which there's an upregulation of type 1 interferon, which may be directly relevant to disease pathogenesis. And I'm emphasizing the second part of the, the definition here because clearly the upregulation of type 1 interferon is present in all of the diseases I'm going to be talking about. But I'm, I'm actually not that interested in biomarkers. I mean, of course, one, one's interested in biomarkers, but you know, if that's the limit of it, uh, in terms of this, this hypothesis, this, this classification, then it's not so interesting. What, what I'm more interested in is the idea that not only uh, is, is the type one interferon system induced, but the interferon is actually causing damage. Uh, and the reason why that's very important is because if that's true, then essentially any anti-interferon therapy might be relevant in these disorders. And I've already suggested uh, during this talk that the, this is an hypothesis and, and, and it is at the moment. I mean, it may all be proved to be at least the second part of the, 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 the definition may prove to be um, false because until we have medicines which can directly uh, downregulate interferon signaling and we use them in individuals and determine whether those medicines have an effect or not, I think we're going to be, it, it, the situation is going to be unclear as to whether the interferon is actually having a pathology, has a pathological uh, role in, in, in these disease processes. Yeah. Okay, so I would say to you that um, the type 1 interferonopathies form a, a, a part of the spectrum of auto-inflammatory diseases. So these are clinical disorders marked by abnormally increased inflammation, predominantly mediated by cells and molecules of the innate immune system. And there is no part of the immune system that is more innate, if you will, than the antiviral interferon mediated response. So we are talking uh, very fundamentally about um, about an auto-inflammatory process. But I, I think also um, what we see in some of these cases is what I describe as a spillover into autoimmunity because, you know, actually the adaptive immune system, of course, the adaptive and the innate immune system talk and, and the innate immune system induces changes that in, in the adaptive immune, immune system. So, there is, a, there is a conversation going on with feedback and, and forward and, 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 um, and negative. So, but I think at heart, at base, these are auto-inflammatory diseases. So you might ask yourselves, um, or I think it's a good question to ask, ask oneself is, how come if this is so, you know, if this is all true, how come uh, essentially, uh, we, I was the first person to suggest this concept in public in 2011. Uh, why, why weren't people doing this kind of thing before? Uh, and why weren't people making these kinds of diagnoses before? Or at least recognizing what they were diagnosing. Um, and the reason is because it, it, it's, it is the case that there is no test Essentially, still worldwide, there is no routine test in clinical medicine for determining if someone is, has got too much interference signaling going on. Yeah? We just don't have that test as a routine assay. And what I can tell you is often, not, or not infrequently, and quite, and quite often, in fact, um, in these individuals, 
the ESR might be normal, the CRP might not might be normal, the, the, the full blood count might be normal, liver function might be normal, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's not until you look specifically for an upregulation of type 1 interferon signaling that you find it. So if you don't do the test, you don't know what you, you know, you don't know what you're looking at. Of course, you know, to an extent now with with um, exome sequencing, you can kind of get around that. But I would I would highlight just here at the moment as an aside, it's interesting when you look at um, the, the mutations in PSMB8, this proteasomal um, associated auto-inflammatory syndrome, sometimes called CANDLE, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but you know, the, these, these proteasomal associated disorders with, with too much interferon signaling, so that, that, that gene was identified in a, a specific phenotype um, originally and published in the American Journal of Human Genetics, but it wasn't until some time after that, when another group actually looked at the transcriptome, that they recognized the link to type 1 interferon. So, you know, really it is the case, if you don't look, you don't find. And what we have done is develop or take, well, it, it, the first on this slide at the top left is, uh, as, as you look at it, is a, a test that we adapted from the lupus doctors where we look at interferon stimulated genes. So interferon is extremely powerful and uh, a little bit of interferon goes a long way to produce a, a significant sort of set of consequences in the immune system. And what we do there is measure the expression of genes that are induced by interferon. So interferon stimulated genes or ISGs. And uh, we developed a test uh, that the lupus doctors had, had first derived a long time ago uh, and have been using that test promiscuously and agnostically in any child, essentially, with uh, anything that we thought might be related to this. And I also then make a second point that it's not, or it wasn't at least, in immediately in obvious what the phenotype might be of too much interferon. You know, what, what would too much interferon do to your body? And actually the answer was, we're not sure. So we've, been, we've, been, we've spread the net very wide. And, and I think as a, as a result of that, we found some interesting things, uh, us, ourselves and other people. Now, you might then ask yourself, well, why, why, why measure the interferon stimulated genes? Why not measure the ligand itself, the interferon? And I come back to a point I just made, that interferon is extremely powerful. And essentially, you can't measure type 1 interferons in the blood or essentially in any human tissue reliably using standard ELISAs because the levels are too small. Well, that was what we suggested. And in fact, then we went on to prove that by developing what we call a digital ELISA. And I won't go into that further, but essentially that's what the, what the bottom half of this, this slide is about. So this is where we actually measure the protein, uh, or interferon alpha protein at femtogram per mil uh, level. So very low concentrations. And what we can find is there's a very nice correlation between the level of protein and the interferon stimulated genes and some of the phenotypes we look at. So armed, with these two assays, one then can go into the field and start looking at the diseases that are associated with too much interferon. So here's, a, here's just a, a, a graph, just to give you a flavor of what, what, what's kind of what we're doing with the interferon signature. So this is, these are, on, on the, on the y-axis is a, 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 an assessment of the expression level of six genes. And the six genes are across the bottom on the, on the X axis. So these are six interferon stimulated genes or interferon signature genes, we've called them here, or ISGs. So these are induced by interferon. Now, at the beginning, you see these blocks of red bars. And just before the block of the red bar, or, uh, for each gene, you can see a tiny, we can just see a tiny bar that's in blue. And that, that, that blue bar is the composite data for 29 controls. So essentially in controls, you don't see interferon signaling unless that individual has an infection say. However, if you take, so this is the, what, what these refer to are the blood samples from an individual, a young woman with a gain of function mutation in STING1, uh, causing a disease called SAVI, which I'll come on to in a bit. 
And what you see is that for every time we, we test her blood, so each, the first bar is at a particular time point for each gene. And then we've taken, you know, here we've got 30, 23, okay, 23 bar, uh, times we've taken blood from this woman. I don't think they're all depicted on here. Maybe they are. Um, but it, what, my point is, it doesn't matter whenever I take a blood from, sample from this child. You know, I could take it every day, I could take it every hour, I could take it once a year, it doesn't matter. When I take it, every time she has a tremendous upregulation of type 1 interferon signaling, a tremendous overexpression of these interferon stimulated genes, as if she's infected by a virus all the time. But there isn't a virus. What's happening here is she's misrepresenting her own. Uh, well, here there's a constitutive activation of STIN, and it's as if she's misrepresenting, um, uh, she, she's, she's being chronically stimulated by a virus, but there is no virus. And, um, and then with our protein assay, this is a way of measuring an interferon alpha protein. And um, what I want you to, if you just look at uh, panel B for a moment, what, what you have in the CNS infection column is what the, the levels of interferon that we measure um, when people with, in, in a set of children with um, a viral meningitis, essentially. And these are the kinds of levels, 10,000 femtograms per mil that you find where, where, where a child is infected with a, a viral encephalitis um, or meningitis. So, and then if you go onto the other side, onto the left-hand panel in the far right with the colored balls or the colored dots. Uh, those are the, the kind of levels we see in the blood of some of these patients with Acardiguchi syndrome and STIN. And you can see that for some of those individuals, the levels in the blood are as high as the levels that we see when someone has an acute viral infection of the central nervous system. Um, what I'll also just draw your attention quickly to is that we find that patients with juvenile systemic lupus erythematosus or well, not just juvenile, but also with juvenile dermatomyositis, they also have high levels of interferon. Both those diseases are well recognized to have an association with type 1 interferon signaling. So to cut the story short then, we've been looking for genes that are associated with too much interferon. And essentially what we do is we find, a, we, we refer to a patient with a phenotype. And uh, I don't really care what the phenotype is, we'll do the interferon response. If it's abnormal, we'll say, well, okay, it could be, could be a red herring, could be an infection, I'm not quite sure, let's do it again. So we do it again, and if we do it three or four times and it's always raised, you know, then, then we know we're onto something. And uh, of course, you know, if we recognize the phenotype, we'll go straight to genetic testing. But if we don't, we do this process, and when we do that process, we then, then we, if, if we find this upregulation of interferon signaling persistently, we'll then go on to genome or exome sequencing. And you know, the, in that way, you slowly accrue genotypes associated with too much interferon. So that was the situation we were at in 2016. Essentially, mutations in any of those boxes in blue were associated with too much interferon signaling. In 2020, this is where we are now. So it's over, there are over 30 monogenic disorders that I could argue can be classified as type 1 interferonopathies. And um, so, so, so this, this repertoire, this stable of disorders is increasing and, and we're learning various things from, 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 from doing that. Um, and so I think the next slide is where I've rearranged some of these genes just to give you a little bit of a, a flavor of something. So above the line in this slide are some genotypes. Um, and I've separated those from genotypes below the line. And essentially, all the genotypes above the line are molecules that are involved in what I'm going to call the metabolism or the sensing of nucleic acid. So these have been, you know, these, 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 um, the function of these proteins has often been uh, explored by other people, innate immunologists, adaptive immunologists, uh, virologists. Um, but what, what I find very interesting and what I think is in favor of our hypothesis that this is uh, about a misrepresentation of self nucleic acid for non-self is that all of these genotypes above the line are related to proteins that are involved in 
uh, breaking down or disposing of self-nucleic acid or the sensing of nucleic acid. And I think this is a powerful piece of evidence in favor of that hypothesis that you are misrepresenting self-nucleic acid as non-self. Okay, so, so actually the, the clinical story begins in Paris where, where I have one of my labs at the Necker Hospital and uh, two very famous pediatric neurologists, uh, uh, the Pelle and Maradona of, of pediatric neurology, Jean Descartes and Francois Gutierre, um, and they were intrigued because they, they, reckon, they identified a number of children who to all, the, I mean, of course, in, in 1984, they, they, the you know, neuroimaging, I mean, MRI didn't exist and you know, people were still doing A and cephalograms, but they had CT and, um, and uh, they, were, they were surprised because they saw a number of patients who they thought had been infected by a virus in the womb. But uh, or they couldn't find a virus. And then they noticed that some, in some of these families, the parents were related to one another, they were consanguineous. And in some of these families also, they saw recurrences in siblings. So these were all kind of warning signs that this wasn't a virus, it wasn't an infection, but actually it was a disorder that looked like infection, but was genetic in basis. And I'll just see if I, what then, okay. So, so then what they did was they, um, uh, a bit further along the line in 1988, uh, they, they were using uh, an assay of interferon activity to, to assess herpes simplex encephalitis. And so they decided that because they had a disease that clinically looked like infection, they wondered if this antiviral activity, this interferon activity was present in these patients. And lo and behold, it was. So this is a really you know, beautiful piece of clinical imagination and using your imagination to make a, a, a really quite a profound um, biological step forward. So I've talked about, uh, I've already shown you a, a version of this slide. Um, these genes in the red bars are the seven genes that have been published up until last week when we published two more genes for echardiogutisinum in, in, in nature genetics. But these are the ones that we've been using, we, you know, people have been working on for quite a while. And the, the, the TREX1, TREX1 is the AGS1 gene. TREX1, what does it do? Well, it's involved in chopping up bits of DNA. RNAs H2, A, B, and C are part of a complex that's involved in, in removing RNA molecules from RNA-DNA hybrids or DNA-DNA sandwiches. SAMHD1 is involved in controlling DNTP pools and, and, and these, are the one, these, are the, these are the building blocks of nucleic acid. ADAR1 is a double-stranded RNA editing enzyme and MDA5 is a sensor of double-stranded RNA in the cytosol. So, so really, AGS fits so perfectly around this paradigm of, of um, self, non-self and problems with discriminating self from non-self. So one of the things I want to emphasize here is, and I, I don't know how many, if or if any, but if there are any pediatric neurologists in, in, in the audience, I just mentioned this, but, it, but it, it's a more general point, which is, not something that you don't know already, but uh, clearly when what, what, what's happened with the advent of, of exome sequencing is that, um, you know, once you find a gene, uh, you, you know, when, when we're looking for a gene, we tend to be quite specific about the phenotype and quite, quite particular about the, the patients that we sequence. But once you have a gene, you can be then um, quite liberal about, you know, trying to think about the extent of the phenotype. So we've learned, you know, in many, many different walks of, of medical life that the, the phenotypes for a disorder are much broader than we first realized. And this is just one example. So it turns out the mutations in any of ADAR1, MDA5 or FVH1 and RNAs-H2B can present as a spastic paraplegia. So, so if you say to a lot of doctors, what's a cardiogutis syndrome? They say, well, it's a terrible disease. It's a, uh, a profound neurological problem. Children um, usually occurs in the first six months of life. Uh, children are left severely disabled uh, without any useful hand 
function, motor function and uh, communication. And that's kind of true, but actually mutations in the same gene, in this case, for example, can cause a pure spastic paraplegia. So, so stiffness of the lower limbs with completely normal neuroimaging and completely intact uh, intellect uh, and completely normal upper limb function. And, and really essentially as a non-progressive disorder. So, so you know, it, it, one has to be, one should not be dogmatic about all of this. And I, I put this up partly because it's interesting, I, I've mentioned that interferon is a poison. And um, here we're suggesting it's a neurological poison. And there's actually a lot of data uh, on the, the potential risks of, of, um, of exposing your brain to, to type 1 interferons. And this is just one example. In, when people were using interferon as a therapy for, for um, hemangiomas in, and, and vascular anomalies in, in young children, interferon is actually quite good at shrinking this kind of stuff. But actually there was a, a flurry of, of papers describing the onset of spastic diplegia in patients who are being treated with interferon. And, uh, and then when the treatment was stopped, uh, the, the problem would resolve. So I think that, you know, that's actually another bit of data uh, in, in favor of this hypothesis. So another phenotype that we've seen, uh, if, if this is a neurological phenotype, but is uh, bilateral striatal necrosis. So these are children who are completely fit and well, um, and then uh, oft, often, uh, develop a seem to develop a problem after a very relatively mild but notable um, infection and develop and, and suffer profound damage to their basal ganglia and left with a, a, a very severe horrible um, dystonic lock-in uh, syndrome with with often with very good preservation of, of intellect and and it's something that looks rather like um, a lot of mitochondrial disorders, actually, and, and, and it's not so uncommon in that, 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 that phenotype. Now, um, some friends of mine, uh, good colleagues that I worked with in Glasgow a long time ago now in, in the 90s, um, were the first people to describe the association of skin disease in a with, with a cardiogutia syndrome. So, and I would say to you in, in many respects that a cardiogutia syndrome is a disease of the brain and the skin. Um, and so they, these were called the vasculitic chilblain-like lesions. And I, I'm not sure that's a very good term, but there we are, we're kind of left with it now. And these are some other examples of the kind of skin lesions that you see um, in patients with a cardiogutia syndrome and, um, and other, type 1 interferonopathies, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So we described um, a mutation in TREX1 associated with what's called familial chilblain lupus. So this is a dominant disorder where there's normal intellect, and uh, but you get these kinds of chilblain-like lesions and you can get destruction of the cartilage. And in in the, they're, they're most commonly on the, on the periphery. So they're much worse in the colon. Hands, feet, ears, nose, those are the classic situ uh, uh, sites of, 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 affection, in, uh, of affliction. So now what I want to do is I want to say to you that this is another piece of data in favor of this hypothesis that it's the interferon that's doing, that's, that's doing the damage. So here on the top left, we have the feet of a child who's now dead with uh, biallelic mutations in RNAs H2B. So fairly classic A. cardiogutis in in the, in the middle on the, on, on the top in, with the blue background are the hands of a young woman who's now dead, who has uh, biallelic mutations in ACP5. She has a disease called spanked. Uh, on top right are the hands of a young man who's still alive with a sting gain of, sting one gain of function mutation. He has savvy, but without any lung disease, it turns out. Then uh, in the middle on the left is a picture I, I, I stole from uh, the Goldback Mansky uh, 2014 New England Journal of, no, actually, no, sorry, that's not true. The, the middle on the left are the cheeks of the boy on the top right. So that, those were his cheeks when he was a little boy and, um, and uh, those are his hands at the top right. And then on the bottom left is a picture I did steal from the New England Journal paper from uh, Rafaela and her colleagues. In 2014, and on the top, on the bottom right, are the cheeks and nose 
of a 70-something-year-old, uh, I think, Japanese woman with a dominant negative heterozygous mutation in TREX1. Now, I'm not a dermatologist, but it really, uh, I don't think you have to be a dermatologist to see the overlap in clinical phenotype here. And no one would have any reason to put TREX1 in terms of the function of the gene before all this story sort of came out would be would be no one would have put the fun, would have put trex1 together with sting together with rnsh 2 b with together with acp5 uh, and and you know it's not immediately obvious why you would put these things together but the reason i believe why we should put these things together the reason why there is such remarkable what i would what i, what I consider to be remarkable clinical overlap is because all of these diseases are associated with too much interferon. And it's the interferon which is the common aspect in, in this story. So um, here's, uh, th this is just to say, I think the, the skin lesions in SAVI are essentially the skin lesions we see in acardiogutazinum. I don't see any difference. Um, and it turns out we've described dominant mutation in TREX1 causing autosomal dominant familial chilblain lupus. And this is the same thing. This is a dominant mutation here in, uh, again, a function mutation in sting um, causing familial tube plane lupus. So you, you're seeing the overlap of these, of these disorders. Now, another clinical sign that I, I want to emphasize to you is the presence of intracranial calcification, best seen on a CT scan. And, you know, it's the same message We've got mutations in any of the AGS-related genes. We've got mutations in ACP5. We've got mutations in ISG15. We've got mutations in PSMB8. And in all of those cases, not always, but in, in, in any of those genotypes, we can find intracranial calcification. Intracranial calcification is a very good marker. I mean, there's many, many, many causes of ICC, but it is a very good marker of, of, of too much interference signaling in your brain. And I just point out to you also that even though no one, to my knowledge at this point, has ever published a sting, a savvy patient with intracranial cancer, with, with neurological disease, when we screen um, patients with savvy by doing a cerebral C, uh, a cranial CT, in some of these individuals, these are three different scans from three different individuals, we see the presence of basal ganglia calcification. And we've got a paper under review showing that actually sting patient, patients with SAVI do have abnormal levels of interferon in their cerebrospinal fluid, but not as high as you see in a cardiogutus syndrome. So again, it really, this, this feature emphasizes the overlap. And the overlap is, I believe, explained by the common fact that all of these genotypes are associated with too much interference signaling. Um, I just emphasize the breadth of, of, of joint disease and of skin disease that you can see in these cases. I think you really, you know, one really should be quite um, open-minded to what these what, what interferon can be associated with it. So, so this is a sibling pair from Australia who have uh, biallelic mutations in a gene called SAMHD1, uh, AGS5. And um, the, the telltale sign, the, the only reason why the clinicians got to the diagnosis was because of these little ear lesions in the, in one, in the brother. Yeah? And otherwise, the, 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 they, were, they, were, they were presenting with a non-destructive but deforming arthropathy. Uh, that was the, I think that was the, the female child. Uh, and then this non-specific rash. So, you know, you, you have to be, it's worth thinking about these things. Uh, we see here you have some paniculitis and lipodystrophy. This is another, this is a boy, this time a, a, an American child with, um, with uh, uh, mutations in SAMHD1. Uh, and uh, he's got neurological problems, but he suffers really badly from his, from his uh, skin disease. So one of the things that we, we described was um, the presence of intracerebral large vessel disease or you know, large medium vessel disease and, and moya moya type phenotype in, in patients with SAMHD1. And so although mutations in any of TREX1, the RNAs H2B complex, SAMHD1, ADA1 and MDA5 
and now LSM11 and, and U7 can cause ACAR de Goodyear syndrome. Uh, there are some differences between these genotypes. So I mentioned the bilateral straight necrosis is essentially specific to mutations in ADAR1. And this kind of phenotype that is on the slide now is essentially specific to mutations in SAMHD1. Not completely so, but essentially uh, so. Um, and one of the things I want to emphasize again, or, or, or I'd like to bring up, I've already talked about phenotypic or variable expression within a genotype. But I also want to say that you can see variable expression within a family. Uh, and I, I think I will be touching on the fact that we also see complete clinical non-penetrance. So here's a story. This is an email from 2018. Um, two girls, 16 and 18 years of age, saw them first when they were five, or one of them was five, for, a for problems with the muscul musculoskeletal system, hip and shoulder pain, restricted joint movement. Then one of the child, one of the children had had a, a stroke at the age of two, was diagnosed with Moya Moya. She had been normal with development up until that time, uh, as had a sister until late childhood. Then the sister developed a Moya, a Moya, Moya or had Moya Moya at the same time. Uh, and both of them had this uh, perniosis or this chilblain like lesions. So within this family, there's some variability in the expression of the disease. And I've seen, a, a, I saw a family in, 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 in the States once where a, a one of the, the, the second born child had fairly classical ACAR de Goodyear syndrome with intracranial calcification, some white matter disease in the brain, but no cerebrovascular anomaly, no moya moya. Her older sister had been completely fit and well, but was then not, but was noted in the, in the wintertime to get chill blains. But otherwise, she was at university in, in Boston. But because the diagnosis had been made and because we knew about this association, that older sister, with all she had was these jaw blades, when they did a brain scan, they found she had very florid, moya moya type features. So remarkable uh, variability within that family. So I'm going to I, I sort of um, not change tack, but I want to sort of take you to a uh, 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 another phenotype, but it's all part of the same thing, in my opinion. And uh, it's a phenotype that's been referred to as singleton Merton syndrome, and it's due to mutations in MDA5 or FEH1. And these are the very same mutations that can cause classical ACAR de Goodyear syndrome. So I don't think, I mean, uh, well, I think the phenotype is quite different, but pathologically, um, it's clearly the same disease. And in fact, we see patients who have a kind of overlap uh, of, of both, both AGS and singleton Merton syndrome. But essentially, this is an interesting disease uh, where you get calcification in the brain, you get calcification of the aortic valves, which is what usually causes death. Um, you can get calcification in the brain without any neurological ma problems manifesting. You get these unusual joint problems, you get psoriatic type features in the skin, and you get a retention of the primary dentition and a subsequent loss of the secondary dentition. And uh, as I said, it's sometimes referred to as singleton Merton syndrome. So this is a remarkable family. So the hands, the hands on the left and the feet below them are those of a young woman in her 20s. And the hands on the right, as you look at the screen, and the, and the feet on, below them are the hands and the feet of the young, the, the 23 year old, 23 year old's mother. Uh, so this is a dominant disease, again, due to mutations in MDA5 or otherwise known as FEH1. And um, remarkable deforming arthropathy. Uh, but what's interesting about the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the imaging in these, the joint imaging in these individuals is that, so you can get subluxation of joints, um, you can get rupture of tendons, you can get insertion, uh, cal calcification at the insertion of the tendons. Uh, you can see a complete loss or a, a loss of teeth. Um, and you can see this calcification of the aortic valve and you can see some calcification in the, in the, in the, um, in, in, in the basal ganglia. So there's the calcification of the aortic valve, the lack of teeth, calcification at the insertion of the tendons there and there and then this subluxation 
uh, but the joints themselves are pristine. So there is an, it's a, a deforming but non-destructive arthropathy. Um, and a little while back, we also published mutations in a molecule called DNAs2, which I'm not going to go into here, but one of the patients had these hands. And uh, at that point, it sort of began to, the penny began to drop a little bit. And I, I realized that actually we were seeing these kinds of hands in all sorts of places. And they're actually reminiscent of this rather enigmatic um, clinical feature referred to as Jacquard's arthropathy, which is previously described in the context of psoriatic arthritis and, and essentially, well, most frequently, psoriasis and, uh, and SLE. Both of those disorders are associated with too much interferon. And actually, you know, really, these are all kind of Mendelian mimics of that um, non-Mendelian phenotype. And again, as I've said for the skin, as I've said for the cerebral calcification, I believe the commonality is because there's something going on with interferon. And essentially what I think is happening here is that this is some kind of fasciitis, some kind of, um, you know, it's about the, the fa facial planes and some way you get this destruction or this deformity without joint destruction. Um, okay, I mentioned, I'm not really going to talk about this very much. I, I've, I've already talked about, I've mentioned sting in very many, very many occasions. The pediatric rheumatologists love savvy. Uh, and I found it quite interesting because actually, you know, I think it's worth pointing out that this, this whole field really developed from the rheumatologists, the, the neurologists. But it wasn't, it wasn't really, it didn't really take off clinically, I, I would say, in some respects, until the rheumatologists were involved. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about rheumatologists compared to uh, neurologists, and this is no disrespect to either, is that rheumatologists are, have been involved much more in, um, with, with the use of biologics. And um, as a consequence of that, what I think was interesting was that the patients with SAVI, described by Raffaella and her colleagues, they'd already been exposed to a lot of, of, of um, of immunosuppressant type therapies and, and biological type therapies, and nothing had worked. These, these children were dying of their lung disease. So, so SAVI is essentially a disorder of the skin and the lung, yeah, and sometimes the joints. Um, and uh, these children were dying of their lung disease. And it wasn't until Raffaella and colleagues in Paris actually described this with two papers in 2014, and then started using JAK inhibitors. So these are, I'll come back to that in a second, that actually they were finally getting some kind of clinical effect. And I think that's very interesting because, you know, that just goes to show that, um, that this is quite specific type of inflammation. So those are some of the skin and joint problems you can see with, you know, terribly florid cases of savvy. And these are all, this is a, a, an image that's taken from the fantastic supplementary information file associated with Raphael Gobert Metzke's 2014 wonderful New England Journal paper. Um, and I've shown you some pictures already of, of, of other patients that we've, we've been looking after. Um, it's a type one interferonopathy. I've already shown you this slide. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, you can see. So just to, just to point out, you can see here, this is, a, this is a child and we've taken her blood on all of these occasions. The first number is her age in decimalized years. And this is the, what we call the interferon score. 63 is enormously high. Um, but what I want to point out to you is that the first time we ever took a blood sample, she was 3.76 de decimalized years. And then in this graph, the last time we took a blood sample from her, she was eight years of age. So it, as, I, as I mentioned very early on, it didn't matter what age she was. Every time we took a blood sample, it was absolutely grossly abnormal. So these are some other patients that we described uh, a few years ago now with uh, mutations in another part of the gene. That doesn't really matter for today's uh, uh, topic, but you can see this, sometimes you see this levido type problem on the, uh, on the skin, but the thing they really die of is the lung disease. So the fact there's lung disease actually brings me to a new kid on the block, which is this disease called copper, copper syndrome. 
And I reviewed um, the paper for Copper syndrome. So Copper syndrome essentially is a disease of the lung, of the kidney and the joints. And they also produce all of antibodies. And it was described in this very nice paper from 2015 in, the, in Nature Genetics. And it was described as an autoimmune disease. And I reviewed this paper before it was submitted to Nature Genetics when it was actually being reviewed at the New England Journal of Medicine. And what I said at the time was, what, where I struggle with this manuscript relates to the claim that the disorder is autoimmune. So I asked, is this really autoimmunity? This was a, what I wrote back to the editor. Um, I said, could it not possibly be a form of autoinflammatory disease with occasional spillover into autoimmunity, e.g. like, a, like the Mendelian inflammatory disorder, a cardiogutis syndrome? I would ask the authors to consider an expression array looking for further clues to the pathways deranged in the patients they report. Could this be related to an induction of type 1 interferon signaling? So that was in June 2014. The paper was published in June 2015. And uh, ever, since, as soon as, ever, ever since I'd seen that, that paper and as soon as it was published, we started actively looking for patients with copper to prove or disprove my, my hypothesis. So here's a, here's a story. Um, this is the first patient that we, um, we, we identified with copper syndrome. Can I ask someone, uh, you're all still there and, and how am I doing for time? Yeah, we, we are perfectly fine with the time. Uh, okay. Continue. Thank you. So here's an 11 year old girl presenting at the age of two and a half years with joint pain and swelling and um, with positive antinuclear antibodies. So she was treated with steroids and uh, she had a clinical remission. Uh, then she developed, so lung disease then became apparent with cough, clubbing, decreased exercise tolerance. And at six years of age, chest CT demonstrated interstitial lung disease. Okay. Um, and she and her mother were found to have this bona fide classic, no doubt about it, heterozygous mutation in this gene called COPE. And what, one of the things I want to point out to you at this point is about clinical um, non-penetrance. So her mother, carrying exactly the same mutation, was completely clinically normal. Not a, not, not a scratch on her, nothing, nothing. Full, you know, we're not talking about mosaicism. She has the mutation in all its glory and she has nothing. Whereas her child is dying of this lung disease and has this problematic um, uh, joint disease. So this was where we started to prove the hypothesis. So essentially um, uh, on, the, on the left hand side, we have our classic interferon signature with six genes. And on the right hand side, we have a, a more modern interferon signature with 24 interferon stimulated genes. You could measure more if you want. Um, and what I want to show basically is that it doesn't matter whenever, just like the, the patients with Sting, whenever I take a blood sample from this child, she has a very significant upregulation of type 1 interferon signaling. So they missed a trick. In that 2015 Nature Genetics paper, they missed a trick. They, they ignored my advice and they missed the link with interferon. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So here's another story. A disease initially manifesting at age two years, life-threatening recurrent alveolar hemorrhage. So in the earlier slide, we found we had interstitial lung disease. Now we've got alveolar hemorrhage. So this girl can drop her hemoglobin. I mean, she, you know, she becomes famously um, uh, anemic uh, and kind of drowns in blood for a while. Uh, and she's got infiltrating, infiltrating lesions on this uh, chest CT, intraalveolar ble bleeding, and interestingly enough, no features of vasculitis. Um, and she's had a lot of these problems. Uh, and she, again, was found to have a bona fide heterozygous dominant mutation in COPE. And again, the mutation was inherited from her completely, completely asymptomatic mother. Really quite remarkable. Um, and what you see here is again, she has an interferon signature. And one point I'll come back to, I think in a moment, but her levels are in green. So this is on one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven occasions that we've taken the blood and all of these six ISGs are high compared to the little blue columns on the left, which are the controls. 
And interestingly enough, her mother only had, her mother has a touch of an interference signature, if I can put it that way, but really very minimally raised. So the, the phenotype is mimic, it is reflected in the interference signature here. So here's a third scenario. Proban, 15 months year old, 15 month old girl, uh, born early, discharged at three months with presumed chronic lung disease of prematurity. Then readmitted soon after with failure to thrive. And she's got wide, widespread ground glass interstitial changes on, on, on a, 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 a X-ray or CT scan of her lung, and she had a lung, lung biopsy. Her mother had been diagnosed with rheumatoid factor positive polyarticular JRA in early childhood, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, um, with no evidence of destructive arthropathy. She had a lung biopsy at eight years because she had abnormal liver function, uh, sorry, uh, um, pulmonary function. And she was diagnosed with interstitial lung disease. And the maternal grandmother had a similar story. She'd been diagnosed with rheumatoid factor poly polyarticular JRA, age 16 years, and she had a lung function problem. And she actually went, underwent a lung transplant and then she died at the age of 38 years. So does anyone want to hesitate or anyone dare tell me what the diagnosis is? Go on, someone. Okay, well, I mean, we've just talked about a copper patient. We've just talked about a copper patient. So the, the answer should be copper, but it's not. The answer is sting. And what I'm trying to emphasize to you here is the remarkable overlap in some cases at least, between SAVI, or mutations in STING1, and mutations in COPE. Okay. So you can start to sort of think about these disorders. I, I'm not gonna go into this, but essentially STING, if you think STING, think copper. If you think copper, think STING. Now there are some differences, and the most obvious difference is that in STING, we, we, well, we've never seen a, sting, a copper patient without skin disease. So we've never seen a copper patient with, sting, with, with skin disease, okay? Um, but otherwise, I think there's a lot of clinical overlap. It's true that alveolar hemorrhage is at least at this time considered to be the more classical phenotype associated with copper, muta co copper mutations, but that's not completely true. We see ILD in copper disease, in copper syndrome, uh, and we can see that at least, well, we know of two cases with alveolar um, hemorrhage with sting mutations. So I would encourage you, you know, particularly those individuals who are interested in lung disease, to think about these two new, th these two disorders. And I just put it as an aside, it turns out there's a nice paper recently, I think coming from India, in fact, I might be wrong about that, but uh, describing patients with COPE mutations and, uh, and hands that remind me very much of the, that Jakub arthropathy that I've already talked about. So um, I won't go into that, but the, the mutations in COP A or cluster in one part of the molecule, and uh, essentially what, what, what those mutations do is they interfere with the ability of copper, COP A, to transfer other molecules called cargo, cargo molecules. Um, and what, we've, what we and others have shown recently in, um, and published in JX Med in, earlier this year is that sting normally sits on the endoplasmic reticulum, but actually it seems that there's a, there's a bit of kind of leakage, if you will, and that sting uh, is, can kind of transfer to, from, the, from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi. And that you have a kind of a, a feedback or a homeostatic mechanism where COP A carries sting back to the, um, to the ER. So you get this kind of leakage, but then it comes back the way because of, because of the function of copper. And when you have mutations in COP A, that doesn't work. Um, and you've got, at that point, you've got constitutive signaling of sting as if it's been switched on in a savvy, with a biosavvy mutation, or as if there's a chronic infection. So that, I think, explains very nicely, in fact, the, um, the overlap between these two disorders. Uh, and there was this nice flurry of papers, including one from our group. Um, 
I won't go. I won't show you that. But, but essentially, because of this, because of this, these are uh, these are this is a large panel of interference stimulated genes. You can see COPE is really magnificent in terms of the number of ISTs that are overexpressed, and because of that, people are starting to use these these drugs that block type one interference signaling. Um, I won't talk about that. Uh, I won't talk about that. Really. So I've mentioned candle I, I can never remember what the what the acronym stands for but it's a uh, it's proteasomal disorder um, looks quite like a progeria in some some respects to me there um, there's some other pictures this is the paper where the first so this was the paper that first described mutations in the gene in 2010 um, but this paper came came out sometimes after after that I, I can't remember the, the year now where they actually described the 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 the, the interference signature. So it was another one of those stories where you know if you don't look, you don't find. So they hadn't done the transcriptomics, so they didn't find the interferon uh, aspect. Um, this is another proteasomal disorder, and uh, I don't know why I've put that there. Just to mention that there's this overlap between. Well, I've mentioned already that people with lupus have endomatomyositis have an interferon signature or can do so these are papers from 2003 and that's where we copied our interferon signature from uh, and it turns out that mutations in trex one can be associated with common or garden lupus i've mentioned about familial chilblain lupus even though i don't think that's a very clever name for that disorder um, i mentioned about Moya Moya disease and large vessel disease in the context of SAMHD1. I said it was almost exclusively associated with SAMHD1 mutations, and that's true, but you can see it in these rare monogenic causes of childhood lupus. Um, there's another example. Um, and uh, we, I, I showed you a picture of this young woman's hands before. So we became interested in monogenic causes of lupus and identified mutations in a, a disease called SPENT. So the, the clue here is they get this uh, platyspondyly and problems with a, a, a spondylo um, um, uh, chondrodysplasia. And uh, so they're quite short. These, these people are short actually. Uh, but what's, what's interesting to me is that they really have a rip roaring proper uh, lupus uh, diagnosis. So this is a really amazing mimic of congenital lupus. Um, and uh, we, a long time ago now, almost 10 years ago, we found mutations in tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase or, or deficiency of TRAP uh, due to mutations in ACP5. So we were interested in monogenic lupus, and we still are to an extent. So I'm just going to finish off with a, a note about treatment. So, you know, I, I, I go back to my hypothesis. I'm interested in interferon signaling as a marker of disease, but what I'm most interested in is the idea that interferon is actually driving the disease. And if interferon is driving the disease, then way, you know, if there are medicines one could use to block interferon signaling, either reduce the amount of interferon or block interferon signaling, then maybe you would do some good. So it turns out that interferon is produced by cells and secreted, and it then attaches to other cells and triggers and signals to them by attaching to the interferon receptor, the IFNAR receptor, or IFNAR. And a constituent of that IFNAR receptor is a molecule called JAK1. And it turns out that there are JAK1 inhibitors on the market. And so we and others have been using these JAK1 inhibitors in some of these disorders that I've been talking about today. And I think we were the first people to describe the use of um, JAK1-2 inhibitor, ruxolitinib, in uh, a savvy or candle in 2016, and we saw a, uh, a, a we saw a positive effect. Um, difficult in the lungs, you know, especially if you've got a lot of damage already. I think it's very difficult to imagine you can go backwards. But in the skin, we saw quite dramatic changes. Um, and then we've also been involved in using them in the context of neurological disease. Um, this is an amazing story. This is a young woman who has a dominant negative heterozygous mutation in TREX1. She has completely normal intellect, no neurological problems, but she has this devastating um, skin disease, as you can see, uh, and, you know, real problems with getting footwear and, and going to school and, you know, all of that kind of thing. 
And uh, she'd been on all sorts of medicines, you know, immunosuppressants and the biologics, etc. So this is her on day zero uh, before she starts ruxolitinib. And this is her three months later or two and a half months later after starting ruxolitinib. So this molecule, th this treatment was having a very significant effect. Now we used it because we, we, we were using it. The hypothesis was that interferon was driving the disease, that uh, interferon signals through JAK1 and that these drugs, drugs drop, block JAK1. They don't just block JAK1. So I can't say to you for certain that this is how they're working, but I think this is another bit of data in favor of the hypothesis that the interferon is actually driving the disease. Um, that's, uh, that's her uh, as a bit older. Um, well, that's her hands and feet again, as I've just shown you, but that's her a little bit older now with really very good skin control. Uh, I won't go into that. There's papers on the use of JAK inhibitors from other groups as well, uh, Rafaela's group. Um, people are using it in the context of, of ruxolitinib, oh, sorry, of dermatomyositis. I won't go into that. Um, I'll just mention one thing. If this is about self, non-self, a failure of non-self self discrimination, then there's only two places in the cell that you can you, you, you have DNA or RNA, and that's the nucleus and the mitochondria. And we're just about to publish a paper that shows that some mitochondrial disorders are also associated with interferon signaling because the mitochondria is full, the mitochondria are full of their own DNA and some RNA. Uh, and I think that's a theme that's gonna be developing over the next, um, next few years. Uh, I've already shown that slide, those are the genes uh, those were the genes that are associated with interfer with a cardiogutis syndrome. Um, there's lots of interest in using these JAK inhibitors in, in this context and other contexts. But I want to share with you a final story before I leave. So this is a story of a young man, um, or a two young men, a boy who was diagnosed with classical a cardiogutis syndrome due to uh, bile mutations in uh, RNAs H2B. He had a brother who we saw at the age of four months at that time was completely neurologically normal. Uh, and so at five months of age, we started on, him on ruxolitinib, a JAK1-2 inhibitor. And he was completely asymptomatic at age 14 months. And his interferon signaling has improved, improved over time. It didn't go back to normal, but it improved. And we began to think that, wow, maybe actually we had solved the problem. You know, that if you caught a cardiogutis in him young enough, uh, you could actually do some good because a lot of children with AGS are initially clinically normal and then something happens. However, unfortunately, at the age of 14 months or 15 months, he became symptomatic. So I got an email on the 13th of January 2019 saying, D. Yannick, I wanted to update you regarding, unfortunately, we admitted him yesterday with adult acute onset, last three weeks of deterioration of milestones. So essentially, this boy had developed a cardiogutis syndrome despite almost, um, almost, uh, nine, uh, almost 10 months of therapy with a JAK inhibitor. I don't think this is the answer to everything. Uh, and there might be a very simple reason for that actually, which is that the, we know that the, um, the concentration of the drug ruxolitinib in the blood versus the concentration in the cerebrospinal fluid is only about 10% in the cerebrospinal fluid. So you've got, a very, you know, you've got much higher levels in the blood than in the, in the brain. Uh, and we've just published this as a small letter in the New England Journal, if you want to see a bit more detail about that. But what I think is important to remember is that there will be other drugs. So there's a lot of excitement about uh, blocking uh, sting, C-gas, and other molecules in the interferon signaling pathway. And I really do think that there are going to be drugs for the, you know, effective drugs. Uh, they're going to be very competent blockers of interferon signaling. And then we'll be able to use these drugs, um, discrete inhibitors of type 1 interferon signaling. And we're going to be able to determine if the hypothesis that the human type 1 interferonopathy as a hypothesis is true, because we're going to be able to use those drugs and see whether they make a difference. Okay, I'm just going to finish off and thank the people in my lab in Paris, uh, the people in my lab in Edinburgh, and various colleagues who've been uh, great 
collaborators and friends, many of them, and then you know, more generally to uh, all collaborating physicians and patients. And we do we receive fairly regularly samples from colleagues in India. We're, I'm involved in a paper at the moment about C1Q deficiency, and um, you know I'm very happy to to try and help if if that's interesting to people. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Crow. That was a fantastic talk. Um, shall we go to the questions or comments in the chat box? No. Uh, Dr. Nihas, please. Do you want me to read them and answer them? No, no, no. Dr. Nihas? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma so we have some comments and uh, some questions in the chat box here. So I'll go through one by one. The first comment is uh, the issue of self vs non-self brings us to the root question, what is self or non-self? There are parts of DNA which are derived from genetic material of ancient viruses known as retroposable elements integrated in our genome. And also there is more microbial DNA in humans than human from the normal microbial flora. So your yeah. comment on that, sir? Yeah, so I think it's a great question. And um, I, I touched on, I mean, I, I, I really didn't want to go into this particularly in detail, but uh, uh, in the talk, which is why I, I, I didn't. But I did touch on this issue when I said that in the cell, there are essentially two sources of nucleic acid, the, the nucleus and the, um, uh, and the, uh, the mitochondria. So uh, people, you know, I think people know that only 1% of the genome is coding for, for protein. So what's all the 99% doing? And uh, people refer to it as junk or dark matter. It turns out that, you know, it, it, like when you go to the beach and you look up at the, the cliffs, you see the kind of geological strata. And if you look in the human genome, about 40% or something like that is actually turns out to be ancient virus and um, that we've, we've actually assimilated into our genome. I mean, it's really quite an extraordinary thing. And so that's what people refer to essentially, I think, when they talk about, well, yeah, when, when they talk about retro elements or retroviruses. And uh, we were very interested in, uh, in the possibility that retro elements, so these are viruses that are in, in our genome and they want to reproduce themselves. And we became very interested in that as a possible mechanism or source of self-nucleic acid. So we, 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 underwent, we undertook a clinical trial using reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So these are the same drugs that are used in HIV. And we published that a couple of years ago in the New England Journal. And we've actually got another grant now to look at that in more detail. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, that, if that, that is the answer, but we, we were interested to, to, to explore that. I think another thing that's come up is that uh, you can you can derive self nucleic acid from uh, DNA damage and DNA repair, and then I've mentioned the mitochondria. As far as microbial DNA, I've no idea. I mean, you know, if I was to write a, if I was if I could implicate microbial flora in in a cardiogutty cinema, I'd probably get a load of drug, of grants because it's extremely um, extremely fashionable. Whether or not it's you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to interpret the, the flora data, but but um, yeah, I, I, I can't say anything more about that. But uh, the retro element stuff, you know, we're interested in and we are exploring. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is: uh, the type one interferons are not in the dynamic range that can be readily measured by conventional ELISAs, necessitating measurement with more expensive digital ELISAs involving rolling circle amplification on commercially available available platforms. So is there room for cheaper home brewed assays based on rolling circle amplification? Or are there any other biomarker which can, which can be measured more readily? CRP is invariably low in patients with SLE who have an elevated type 1 interferon response. How does it fare in other type 1 interferon, interferon properties? Yeah, so I mean, I, I've already touched on on the fact that we use these two assays. One's an indirect marker of interferon activity, 
and one is a, a, a where we actually measure the ligand. Now, I think I think you know th there's a kind of a sin by omission in in my talk, which uh, I'm happy to discuss. But essentially, you know, we we talk about type one interference, but what do we actually mean by that? I mean, there are at least 13 subtypes of interferon alpha. Then there's interferon beta. Um, and, you know, then we can also talk about lambda, type 3, I mean, gamma, I don't think really comes into this, but, but uh, the interferon signature is a signature of interferon, type 1 interferon activity and 3 interferon activity. It's not specific. The problem with the ELISAs is that, as I mentioned earlier on, the interferon is, so, is uh, produced at such low concentrations that it's difficult to pick it up with routine ELISAs. So we developed this digital ELISA assay. It doesn't work by rolling uh, circle amplification. It sort of works by, essentially, it's, an, it's a standard ELISA. But the reason how it works is because it, the, the plate has these tiny, tiny wells and effectively, these wells are just big enough for one molecule of antibody and one molecule of protein to roll into the hole, and then you seal the well. So instead of having, so you then get a digital readout. But I mean that, yeah, you're right. That is expensive, and and it's only for interferon alpha or interferon beta. You can't have, you know, we don't have a. It's for a specific protein. I actually think the best test is the interferon signature because it captures an amplification process from the ligand to a signal that's generated by the ligand and it doesn't it's agnostic as to whether it's interferon alpha or beta or, or lambda so or gamma in fact for that matter so i actually think that the 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 isgs is the best test um, and as I, as I mentioned in the talk, you know, you can have plenty of these people can have normal ESRs, normal CRPs. So you can't go by, you know, some of them do have <coughs> markers of information, but not all of them by any means. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is uh, type 1 interferon of these are good as a unifying concept supported by serotyping skin, CNS or rheumatological lesions. But what is the explanation for different manifestation with the same variant, often in the same family? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think I, I think it's fascinating. At the same time, I think it's important to remember that uh, variable expression and even non-penetrance are well-recognized concepts in throughout Mendelian genetics. You know, for example, so you know, tuberous cirrhosis, neurofibromatosis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, one, one sees this phenomenon all, all, a lot of the, uh, you know, frequently. Uh, the, the simple answer is, but it's of no help whatsoever, is, is it's either environment or, or, it's, or it's other genetics. So of course, it could be other polymorphisms in genes or it could be environmental factors. In the, in the context of the type 1 interferonopathies, I mentioned the bilateral striatal necrosis, and I mentioned the, uh, the, it, this devastating destruction of the basal ganglia frequently happens apparently after uh, a non-specific but notable infection. So when, I first, when we first described that paper, I went and met several of the families. And I, it was when I was taking the stories from the patients, from the families, I was saying, you know, tell me what happened. And, you know, I remember one, a family in, in, in Preston in, in Lancashire t saying to me, well, well, you know, well, um, our first child, he, he was fine and then he got chickenpox. And then about three days later, he had this devastating neurological onset of dystonia. And his brother then was, he was fine as well up until 10 months of age. And then he got a diarrhea and vomiting illness. And then suddenly his, his neurology went off. So I think, I think infection, you know, is not unreasonable when we're talking about you know, these people are supercharged. It's as if they, you know, they're, they're supercharged to fight infection. And if you overwhelm the system with just, you know, interferon is, is really toxic. Um, so then the other problem at the moment is that people are saying to me, uh, they're also, families now are also saying, we think it's va vaccination. And, you know, I don't know, <laughs> because it could be. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, good question. Uh, uh, that's as best as I can do for an answer. Oh, I can't hear. Sorry. 
Okay, sir. Can you hear? Yeah. yeah. Sir, uh, next question is, have you come across pseudo-angioma as a cutaneous feature as well? Well, if I have, I wouldn't know it because I'm not quite sure what a pseudo-angioma is, I'm, I'm afraid. But but I, I'm not, I don't recognize the term. I've never sort of really heard of anyone talking about it. Um, so so I think I'm, yeah, I, I'm saying no, but I, I'm happy to be proved wrong. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. So uh, next question is, uh, Patients with severe COVID-19 infection have been found to have anti-type 1 interferon and autoantibodies. Have these patients with type 1 interferonopathies done expectedly well with COVID-19? Yeah, so that's an interesting question and, and, and uh, something that we have, so I know Jean-Laurent Casanova well, I mean, we're in the same institute in, in, in Paris and he, he produced a remarkable paper in science. Um, and... Uh, it's a question we, we've talked about, but the problem is, and I think, well, of course, one didn't know, but the, the well, first of all, a, all these diseases are rare, so it's hard to get you know, big numbers. The second is that all of these patients have been um, hibernating; they've been, they've been, you know, they've been extreme kind of lockdown because the parents are very anxious. So actually, the very few of them have been exposed. But I think it's one of the great, it's one of the few saving graces of the COVID pandemic, and and um, you know that children have been also you know have been have been protect relatively you know, uh, not at risk and uh, so I think it's a super question and unfortunately I can't really say but what I can say is that I frequently hear the story so some of these children are severely disabled you know difficulty following they've got epilepsy maybe all these kinds of risk factors for infection. I frequently hear the story of parents saying to me, ah, oh, yeah, you know, it's funny, despite the fact that he or she have got all these problems, you know, they don't get all the infections that their brother or sister get who doesn't have a cardiogutia syndrome. These people are, they are not immunosuppressed. They are actually very efficient at, fight, at fighting off infection. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. <clears throat> the next question is uh, from Dr. Kishore. The yeah. huge clinical uh, heterogeneity in these patients, which often does not match with the interferon signatures, presents with the difficult question of who would respond to the jack key and optimizing parental expectations. Yeah, so so it's a good question. I'm going to dissect it just for a moment. I mean, I think the genotypes on the whole are very well reflected by the interferon signature. I think the there are a couple of problems though. Um, it's true that the, 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 the degree of disease, if you will, um, does, isn't, isn't necessarily reflected by the, by, by the extreme, by, by the level of interferon signaging. And the most extreme examples, as, as I've shown already, are these patients who, well, I actually know it's quite interesting, actually, in the, in the copper patients, it is true, in fact, that the patients who are the mutation carriers who are clinically asymptomatic essentially don't show a signature. So actually there, the signature does mimic the, or does follow with the clinical phenotype. Where what I didn't really show was patients with, I, I glossed over, I, I went through a slide that I didn't talk about, but perhaps I should have done, which is patients, persons with mutations in MDA5 in particular are very interesting because there with mutations in MDA5, there's about a 13% non-penetrance rate. And those patients who are clinically non-penetrant, completely asymptomatic in their, into their 50s and 60s and 70s, they, they still demonstrate, I think someone might need to mute, um, uh, they still show a very significant interferon signature. So th there it's true. Um, it doesn't match with the interferon, it presents with the difficulty of who would respond. Well, I, I, think, I, think, you, I think you treat whoever's got you know, bad disease. But what the other thing we've learned is, I mean, and this actually could take me a few minutes to talk about, so I probably won't, but we, we have found that the interferon signature at the doses of JAK inhibition that we have used, the interferon signature is not a very helpful dynamic marker. So we've never really been able to suppress it fully. Although, I mean, if I then look at our experience with dermatomyositis, what I would say there is when you make a patient with dermatomyositis better, 
interferon signaling is better. So I think I think we need to do more work. I think that you know it's partially true, it's partially not true. Um, I don't think that JAK1 inhibitors are the the answer to all our dreams or all our you know yeah, all our wishes. Yeah. How much time do you have for questions? Can you answer a few more? Yeah, I can. Yeah, a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sir. So the next question is from Dr. Amit Rawat. So you have asked, uh, you have mentioned DNA repair defects such as ATM artemisis as a cause of type 1 interferonopathies. Is the CNS damage in AT par partly mediated by elevated interferons? Also, any update on the use of reverse transcriptase inhibitors in type 1 interferonopathies? Yeah, okay. So I think this is a very interesting question. Um, so I, I didn't put it up, but what I would say to you in very general terms is I think that if you look at the, that catalog of diseases that we, we're classifying as type 1 interferonopathies, I think some of them are, are more interferon dependent than others. And I would say to you, I think currently that AGS is a sort of Kind of pure interferonopathy, whereas I think mutations in Artemis and ATM, uh, you know, they're impure. Where, and I suppose one simple explanation, you know, you could say, well, the interference nothing to do with anything, you know. And, and if you if you if I say to you that thirteen percent of people of mutation carriers, thirteen percent of pe of persons that we've identified carrying a mutation in MDA five or FEH one demonstrate a signature but are clinically asymptomatic, it would be not unreasonable for you to say, well, Yannick, it's all a load of rubbish. You know, the interferon has nothing to do with anything. You're telling me there are people who are you know, completely clinically asymptomatic with lots of interferon. You know, there you go. But what I would say about the Artemis and ATM is that uh, I, I, it also brings up another point. These proteins that are mutated, some of them have, well, they all probably have more than one job. But I would say that ATM and, and Artemis, for example, they have their major function is in DNA repair. And the kind of the interferon stuff is a kind of adjunct, it's, a, it's an offshoot, if you will. Whereas I think in, in the tracks one say, its day job is to sort out, you know, make sure you don't misrepresent self as non-self. So I, I think that's sort of, you know, and as, I, you know, I mean, uh, I, we've never tested, I think it's a great sadness. I'd be very interested to test the cerebrospinal fluid and the blood of patients with cocaine syndrome. So they have white matter disease, they have calcification, it's a, it's a DNA damage, you know, DNA repair disorder. Do they have interferon signaling? Is their brain phenotype due to too much interferon? I don't know the answer to that, but I'd, I'd put a small, you know, a pound on that, but I'd bet something on that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Everyone is not unmuted, Dr. Nihas. Yes, 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 ma'am, yes, ma'am. So uh, we'll go to the next question. So next question is by Dr. Rajesh uh, from Calicut. Uh, he's telling, we had a child with AGS with IF1, H1 mutation who presented with warm and antibody autoimmune hemolytic anemia who also had a stroke during the recovery phase. So how commonly is autoimmune hemolytic anemia in your cohort with other AGS related mutations? Yeah. So I would, I can't give you a precise figure, but I would say to you that it's, uh, it's, we've seen it not infrequently. So we see a lot of it in spent or, well, spent is very rare actually, but a lot of the patients with spent had uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And uh, we've seen it sometimes in MDA5 mutations. And what we've found is that in, in a very small number we've treated, it's responded well to the JAK inhibition. Um, I'm interested in the fact that the child had a stroke during the recovery process. That's interesting. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's worth... You know, that, that's an example, I suppose, of what I'm suggesting where you get this kind of spillover into but you know what, what, I, what one thing i just mentioned here is that if you if you play a word association game with a lot of physicians 
if you say interference, if you say interferon to a lot of physicians and say, what's your word association? They'll say lupus. Uh, but actually, although we do see lupus in, in some of these monogenic disorders, it's the exception and not the rule. The except with spent, where really it's very common. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's going off off piece a little bit. Thank you. Okay, sir. <clears throat> Next question is: uh, Is there any screening test prior to genetic testing, like DADA two levels in DADA two? How practical is looking at interferon signaling as a screen? Do all symptomatic patients have high in inflammatory markers? Also, yeah. uh, should all cases of familial lupus be checked for interferonopathies? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, is there a screening test prior to genetic testing like DADA2? Um, yes and no. I mean, I, I, I would say in some respect, that yes, the, the interferon signature, I think is a great test. Um, uh, you know, it, but no, because it's not specific. Um, the DADA2 test uh, for, for ADA2 is, 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 is a very specific test. Um, so that's great. You know, we don't have that. We don't have an ends, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't have that. So, okay, that's, that's the way it rolls. Um, how practical is looking at interferon signal? Well, it's very practical. I mean, we have literally done thousands of these. You know, we, we published a paper in Journal of Clinical Immunology in 2016 where we we said, I think at that time, we'd done 2,000 of them and we published results on almost 1,000 of them. Um, it's very practical. It's not inexpensive. I mean, it's practical because we use a Pax gene tube and the Pax gene tube is great because it travels at room temperature. So that means you don't have to prepare serum. Uh, you don't have to have a fresh sample. Uh, it, can, it can travel at room temperature and it lasts at least for 72 hours, you know, and then you put it in the freezer. So it's very practical, but it's but it's but it's not you know it, it takes some work, and um, and it's not you know it costs about eighty quid a time or it costs us about eighty pounds a time, uh, so so you know it's not it's not perfect in, in that respect, but it's very practical. We do it all the time. Um, should all cases of familial lupus be checked for interferonopathies? Well. I don't know. I mean, I, I suspect that if you've got familial lupus, they're going to have a raised level of interferon. So I don't know if that's going to help you, except that what I would say to you more generally is I think that the ACR criteria for lupus are terrible. I mean, they're so imprecise, which is why I think people have a lot of problems with the diagnosis of lupus. And I don't know really why people don't do interferon. Well, I do know why, but people should, in my opinion, and they will at some point, I believe, do interferon signaling as part of the diagnostic criteria for lupus. Um, and then more generally, you know, if you've got familial lupus, then that's unusual, especially if it's early onset. And uh, we and others are looking for Mendelian causes of that, and I encourage you to, to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, sir. <clears throat> the next, next question is from Dr. Santia. So the question is, is there any reason why interferonopathies do not have predominant myositis as compared to the phenotype seen when antibodies against viral sensors are present as in Im immune myositis where interferon is an important part of patho pathogenesis? Okay, so that's a nice question. Well, I, I, it's interesting and I think it's touching on something that uh, I, I didn't talk about. But, but um, so uh, if I, I think I'm going to read between the lines. So when... Um, when I went to Paris in 2014, the, then the, the, the Sting papers were published by Raffaella and a colleague in Imagine, Fred, Fred Rioloca. And uh, I also began knocking around with <coughs> pediatric rheumatologists. The first time I'd ever done that, really, because I've been mainly involved with neurologists. And, uh, you know, I got interested in dermatomyositis and connective tissue disease and the overlap between SLE and DM, and you know, uh, it all got a bit confusing in my head. Um, and then I realized there was this very, you know, I think it's quite impressive the way people can classify dermatomyositis on the basis of the antibodies. And of course, there is this antibody positive, MDA5 antibody positive subtype of dermatomyositis. And they're very interesting because they not they don't always have any 
um, uh, muscle involvement, but they can have lung involvement. So the lung involvement, sting, copper, I just thought to myself, oh, this is all going to be due to sting mutations or copper mutations. So we did a bit of sequencing in dermatomyositis um, and we didn't find anything. But, you know, it is fascinating. Why, how come these antibodies against MDA5? So that, that subgroup of dermatomyositis as the subgroup has the most type 1 interference signaling. It's really, really, really strong signal. Um, why don't patients with AGS get muscle disease? Well, they don't get dermatomyositis, it's true. Why don't patients with AGS get lung disease? They don't really. So how come copper gets lung disease and sting gets lung disease and AGS doesn't get lung disease? How come sting gets skin disease but copper doesn't get sting disease? If it's all about interferon, Professor Crow, how come? They all don't show the same thing. Your theory is rubbish. So, you know, again, it could be a rubbish theory. I'd also say that, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier on, some genes have a day job and then they have another job. And, you know, some genes are, per, are expressed in some tissues and, and, uh, and not in other tissues. Some genes might be redundant in some tissues and not in other tissues because of expression of another gene that does the same job in that tissue. So. Uh, I think these are all fascinating questions. Um, I don't think they blow a hole necessarily in the hypothesis, but you know, I come back to the the, the, the the statement, this is an hypothesis and we have to prove it. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, sir. So uh, next question is uh, by uh, Dr. Sunita. She's asking, do SLE patients with predominant neurological manifestations have something like to do with more interferon signature than those without. Um, sorry, say that again, please. Yeah, sure, sir. Do SLE patients yeah. with predominant neurological manifestations yeah. have something like to do with more interferon signature than those without? Yeah, so that's a good question. It's one of the questions we're trying to look at at the moment. So. We are interested in patients with SLE who have neurological involvement. So, you know, a very, somewhat vague term, neuropsychiatric lupus. Exploring with a, a, a close colleague in the, who, who's still affiliated to the lab, to the PhD in a lab called Isabel Melki, where we are looking at interferon signaling in blood and in cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and our data suggests that there, there is increased levels of, um, of interferon alpha protein in the cerebral spinal fluid of those individuals. So I'm not surprised. And in fact, if you look at the old literature, even in adult SLE, there's quite a high percentage or there was when people were doing CT scans. The problem with MRIs is it really, you can miss a lot of calcium. And you can have a lot of calcium in your brain without having any obvious neurological features, at least at first. Um, but if you look in the old literature, there was quite a high percentage of, you know, several percent of patients with lupus have been described to have intracranial calcification of the basal ganglia. And I've mentioned already that I think that's a telltale sign in some cases of too much interferon. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. So we have a couple of more questions. Uh, can I go forward, sir? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, sir. So the next question is from Dr. Amita Akarwal. How many gene ISG is sufficient to give a good read out of an IFN signature? Yeah, so it's a good question. And, and I think there isn't a right or a wrong answer. Uh, I mean, you could, you could do one, but I think that would be dangerous and a bit silly because, um, because you know, some of them... I just don't think it's enough. Um, and there's one gene in particular, if 27 which can be very high sometimes even in controls. It's, it's a remarkably labile gene. Um, we, do, we were doing six. Uh, we now do 24. You could do an RNA-seq experiment every time. Uh, of course you could, but that would be expensive. Um, Medimmune, or uh, for their, as a kind of companion diagnostic for, the, for, for anafrilumab, um, at one point, at least, they were describing a kind of diagnostic, a companion diagnostic test with three ISG. I mean, personally, I think, I think the nanostring platform that we now use has 24 ISGs, and I think that's plenty. 
Um, but we, you know, we did several thousand of these using six. Um, it's a, really a question of cost and time, but uh, I think you, you need to do more than, I would say, I would say six is a good number. Um, you know, less than that, maybe you could get away with four. Uh, the, the important thing partly is also about, as I mentioned, serial testing. You know, that's important. Once, once, once if you think you've got the clinical phenotype, okay, but where you don't know what's going on, you need to do it several times to make sure it's not false positive. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, sir, for that uh, nice uh, uh, question and answer session we went through. So that is uh, from the question and answer session. Oh, thank you, sir, uh, for that nice session and nice talk, which you enlightened us on the interferonopathies. And mm -hmm. I uh, hand over the mic to Dr. Keita, madam. Yeah. Thanks, Nihas, for doing the question and answer session. Uh, we have Dr. Kishore Varia from the UK, our old student, who's now a leading pediatric rheumatologist over there. Dr. Kishore, a few words from you. Dr. Kishore? Can you unmute yourself, Dr. Kishu? Uh, hi, Prof. Thanks ever so much for another fantastic uh, talk. It was a pleasure to be part of this. Um, and I think uh, it was important that we did this because it's a relatively new concept for many of my colleagues back home in India. And I'm sure they would have appreciated um, uh, um, uh, and um, they would think about it when they come across with patients with these clinical features, which, ho which is the whole idea of actually introducing this topic among the general pediatric fraternity in India. And thank you very much for doing that. My pleasure. Thank you for the invite. And, um, and um, you know, I'm very happy to answer questions by email. I mean, you know, I, I, um, I always try to respond to emails. Uh, so, yeah. Good. Fantastic. Thank you all. Uh, we have a few words from Dr. Vinod Skaria, who is a computational biologist and molecular geneticist at CSIR IGIB Delhi, and who collaborates uh, great, in a great way, a fantastic collaborator in our primary immune deficiency project. Dr. Vinod? Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Crow, for the fantastic talk. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to uh, learn more about uh, the work that you do, apart from the publications, of course, many that you have published on these diseases. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for uh, giving up your Friday evening. <laughs> Dr. Vinod is the scientist who's done work with the zebrafish models and they use that in the lab as one of the model organisms. So I thought you would like to speak to you. So it's been really a fantastic uh, eye-opener, uh, this talk. And uh, actually, uh, we would like the pediatric audience uh, to know more about these rare disorders, which may not be as rare as we thought uh, they were. Like for example, we thought hyper-IGD syndrome was only seen in the Mediterranean and uh, it would not be present in this country, but we are having to change our opinion rapidly. So uh, it's really nice and I'm sure a lot of young pediatricians would be inspired by the great uh, cutting edge research you're doing right now and uh, would look for these diseases. And it's, it's really gratifying that you not only find these diseases, uh, elucidate the underlying pathogenetic mechanisms, but also find treatments so that uh, the quality of life for these children and their families uh, improves. That's uh, really fantastic. And uh, it's really nice that you spend so much time answering all questions. I'm sure you have a busy schedule and I do apologize for the little technical snags we had some people getting unmuted on and off. I'm very sorry for that. I'd like to thank all the delegates who have uh, wholeheartedly participated in this session and asked lots of interesting questions 
and mm -hmm. joined in the deliberations. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Kishore for all his help in arranging this session. And uh, Dr. Ajit, would you want to say something, Dr. Ajit? No, actually, uh, it was an eye opener, uh, Dr. Yannick Crow, and uh, really interesting aspect of the research. I hope that uh, such type of research uh, also gets uh, uh, gets being done. It should be done in our in, in our country. Like, uh, I think we can collaborate and uh, in areas where we can. And this is a platform for that too, and uh, for collaboration and sure. uh, in research. And, uh, yeah, no, I think that's right. And that's really fascinating. Yeah, that's really Thank fascinating. you. So I think, I mean, I just mentioned, I think that a cardiogucci syndrome is much more common than people realize. I mean, it, it, all these things are rare, but as a rare disease, it's really one of the most common diseases. Uh, or, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's an important yeah. disease to know about. Uh, and then anyway, yeah, if I can help in any way, let me know. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Good. Thank, Thank you. So you much. Yeah. Take Thanks care. for this uh, scintillating talk. Shall we close then? Yeah. Thank you so much from all of us. Okay, man. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Bye. Dr. Nihas, for being a wonderful Thank host. Thanks. Safe travels. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for being